I want to bring in now our anchor and chief investigative reporter, Joe Holden, to shed some light and perspective about this area and the infrastructure there. Not only that, Joe, but we know you are well versed in environmental concerns as well. So you have some to break down, a lot to break down here about what's happening out there on I 95 this morning. Hi, Joe. Hi, J Hi, John. Good morning. I wish it was under better terms. And in fact, my gut reaction when I saw this this morning was, oh, my Lord, the highway is gone and you could clearly see that from chopper video uh no question about the integrity gone tomorrow alexander from the managing director's office telling us it will be a long time to address this so environmentally let's start there it's hard to contain some of these uh, volatile chemicals and uh, uh really flammable toxins when there's a fire still burning in that area I was looking at some maps of some of how the, uh, the sewer lines uh, integrate in that area. And so if there was a tanker truck under Interstate 95 that in the process of burning ruptured and then began to leak, it is so close to the river. You have a water treatment facility not too far uh, away from the area of Cotman and State under Interstate 95. So there is a lot of infrastructure going on. And if you think about a uh, path of least resistance with water, uh, it's uh, heading to the river. And if there is an ignition source, and there was, uh, firefighters are contending with, as Madeline Wright very vividly described an hour or so ago, these manhole covers flipping through the skies like coins. Uh, an incredible and alarming visual just to even think about. The highway itself, let's talk about it. If you're from Philly, you know this area. Uh, the Federal Department of Transportation and PennDOT have been working on this uh, six to eight mile stretch of Interstate 95 for forever. It's at least a 10 to 12 year long project at, at this moment. It's expected to stretch for a few years more where they were rehabilitating, reconfiguring and expanding the highway. This is the really nice stretch of Interstate 95. It is wide. Uh, there's actually almost, you could say, room for error in this area as opposed to what 95 used to look like. And then being from Philadelphia, if you were here, if you were around, if you were born and raised 1996, most of us can recall an eerily reminiscent situation near Bridge Street where they determined an arson started a massive tire fire that completely undermined the highway. It was closed for weeks. It spelled uh, a, a transportation nightmare in trying to get from one end of Philadelphia to the other side. And what's the big picture, folks? What does that mean? From one end of Philadelphia to the other side, that affects the northeast and the southeast, the mid-Atlantic of our entire uh, network of, of going from A to B. Interstate 95, according to federal transportation records I just looked at in this area, carries 125,000 vehicles. There can be give and take in that number. That's an average of, of daily ridership. But this is uh, the main arterial north and south in our country. And the fact that it is um, clotted, if you will, it is broken, it is in pieces uh, at, at uh, the Tacony area in Philadelphia is deeply troubling. And again, the reporting of the managing director is this is going to be a long time. And the uh, head of OEM at the scene there says that this is broken. The highway is broken. It is gone, in his words. And uh, some information I'm getting right now, the city, all of the stakeholders in this will be having a conference call. So that's going to be a behind-the-scenes chat about what are we going to do uh, with this. Department of Transportation and uh, federal agencies run drills for this kind of stuff. They have, uh, you know, big boards and white boards that point out if there is a catastrophic incident on Interstate 95, uh, this falls under that uh, characterization, that they then start putting up advisories, uh, truck traffic, vehicular traffic, should probably south of us be thinking about the Delaware Memorial Bridges using the Jersey Turnpike to get north. Chandler's uh, been watching and, and the the coverage has been uh, informative about how to get around this. Uh, that is going to take place in this conference call. The environmental end of it is going to also unfold, as well as uh, whatever investigation now picks up. 
Uh, I'm asking all around about whether uh, there are uh, signs of uh, an investigation heading in a particular direction. Everyone is uh, paying particular caution not to, uh, I would say, mischaracterize the moment we're seeing right now, but they're trying to put that fire out, contain any environmental uh, runaway, uh, these chemicals and toxins and accelerants, uh, trying to get a handle on this. And Jan, I know we talked about a lot, uh, and I really uh, think that this incident, uh, you know, certainly hearing from my sources, nothing short of a catastrophe. Oh, absolutely. This chopper video is absolutely stunning. We're talking about the interstate, Interstate 95, that is broken and crashed down onto the road below. And Joe, unfortunately, as you mentioned, we saw an eerily similar situation just about 30 years ago. I wonder if you can provide even more perspective and comparison between those two, what happened in 1996 compared to what we're seeing on our screen right now, and to compare the possible length of um, repair that happened then and what we could see now, this being so much more significant. You know, John, I remember uh, I was a junior in high school and uh, glued to the news because, uh, you know, in the immediate days after this, Philadelphia discovered they store a lot of tires under the interstate. There were a lot of tire lots and used tires and old tires. There wasn't really a recycling of tires in 1996, and it melted the road. Uh, the superstructure of Interstate 95, the steel and the concrete uh, melted under the uh, intense heat of that tire fire in 1996. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation had a, uh, a, a somewhat of a, of a Band-Aid solution to it, uh, but it was, oh man, I think it was several months, maybe a year before the actual lanes of the highway were back to what the uh, Department of Transportation would grade as sufficient uh, to carry the amount of vehicles uh, that the highway does carry. Uh, another thing that I know they are able to do in an urban area such as Philadelphia, it's a little trickier, but if the southbound lanes of Interstate 95 have not been compromised, and I know they're testing concrete, that they're taking samples, that's all going to happen as soon as it's safe if the fire is still burning and it is not safe. They, they can't go in there, but they will determine if they can shift two-lane traffic, two-way traffic make that, onto the southbound lanes. But how do they do that in respect to exits, on-ramps, off-ramps? Um, all of that, I'm told by my sources, is coming up to debate and discussion at this 10 o'clock conference call. And uh, I will be minding the situation to see uh, what, uh, you know, best and timely reporting we can, we can draw from that. I was thinking the same thing. Can they even use the southbound lanes? This was a huge fire, and we already know that there was damage done to the southbound lanes. Can they fix that? Can they use that to help ease traffic in that area? Joe Holden calling in for us, providing that perspective on the infrastructure in this area and environmental concerns moving forward. Joe, thank you so much for joining us.